This is going to be a good. Hello, recording friends. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you're new. My name is Mel, and today I bring you guys a super cool video where I'm going to be reading one star reviews of my favorite books. I know I'm not the only one that sometimes I finish reading a book, I absolutely love it, and then I go onto the internet or I start discussing with people around me, and turns out they didn't love the book as much as I did, and there's actually a lot of interesting and funny comments surrounding why they didn't like the book or potentially why they did not finish it. And so I thought it would be super interesting if I went onto the interwebs, into Goodreads in particular, and I perused some of my favorite books, saw the one-star ratings, picked out a few for this video, and not only reacted to them here with you, but also refuted some points as to why I liked it, depending on why the person said they disliked the book. And before I get started with the content of today's video, I do need to shout out the sponsor of today's video, which I am super excited to be partnering with, and that is Sundance Now. If you guys are are not familiar with Sundance Now, let me hook you up to the real stuff. It is an ad-free streaming service that was created by AMC Networks, specifically for people who love riveting storytelling and super fresh perspectives on their media. If you're like me and you get super invested with the characters and you love to love them and love to hate them, there is always something to watch on Sundance Now, from prestige dramas to international chilling thrillers, all the way to true crime shows. If you're the type of person that loves to watch shows from around the world, Sundance Now will be the perfect option because not only do they have weekly releases that are sure to be your cup of tea, but you also won't be able to find them anywhere else. It is also super easy to stream with Sundance now because you can download the app from Apple or Android, and you will even be able to watch on your Amazon Fire TV, Google Chromecast, and Roku. You guys know me, you guys know what I'm into, and if you would be able to peep right here, you'd see A Discovery of Witches, which has come back for its final season, and yes, you can watch it on Sundance now. It is the perfect perfect mix between a period drama, a romance between a witch and a vampire, and all the angst and magic and supernaturalness that you can possibly imagine. If you do want to try Sundance Now, you can go to SundanceNow.com and use the code MELREADS to get your first 30 days for free and stream everything that they have to offer. So thank you so much to Sundance Now for sponsoring today's video, and let's get right into these one-star reviews. Okay, people, I have the screenshots. I have the receipts. I think since we are currently in the era of the green Bone Saga along, it is only fitting for me to start out this video with Jade City by Fonda Lee, which if you guys have read this and if you guys watched the live show, or if you haven't watched the live show and you don't know, I loved this book. I gave it 4.5 stars and I love everything about it from the super well-crafted characters to the super interesting political world and the mafia gang vibes that this had. I love a good family saga and this book personally delivered on all of that. This book made me feel only anger. How could something about gangs and Jade magic be so bad? boring. The characters made ridiculous decision after ridiculous decision and Hilo had anger issues. If he grabbed me and shook me violently like he did for all the other characters for no reason, I would hit him. Hard. All I have to say is, I'd like to see you try. I don't know how well we'd bear in a fight against Hilo. I feel like he'd really beat us up, especially with the amount of jade that this man bears, especially given his position at the end of Jade City. I don't think we could stand that strong against him. Maybe if you took out the jade, maybe it'd be a different story. But with that on, I am sad to report. I I also think, all jokes aside, if you look at the premise of the story and you look at what the story is about, I think ridiculous and reckless decisions are a given. A lot of these characters are being put in very unlikely and crazy situations. They are going to react recklessly and crazily to everything that's happening. A lot of these situations are new. A lot of them are very anger-driven. I think given the fact that this is a family saga, things get personal very, very quickly. And when it is a personal attack to you, your family, your set of beliefs, and how you're ruling a certain an area of your land, of your country, I can only assume the family will get mad. I think it's also a given that Hilo does have anger issues, and he is also just a tinsy bit misogynistic. I think that's, I think that's a given, and it's also commentary. Predictable, lackluster character development, bad and unappealing sex scenes. I kind of have to agree with that one, though, because one of them really did feel like it was out of a bad porno, which are completely unnecessary and not at all well thought out. Definitely not worth your time. Take out the sex scenes, and this could be a YA novel? Wait, I didn't read that part. Might be a better audience for 
for it too? I've got many questions on this. <laughs> See, when I look at this one, I agree with the sex thing. They were definitely unnecessary. The first one, eh, it was there. The second one though, it just no. Sex scenes, definitely not fond of Lee's strength. I think we can all admit that because the second one was just downright bad. Even though age groups are just a suggestion as to which audience this will appeal best to and which audience will potentially comprehend the content of the book more, I don't know how many young adults, how many teenagers would actually be down to reading a book that is so heavily political and that the basis of the story is literally politics. I don't know how interesting that would be if you literally take the sex scenes out, which mind you are two and I think they encompass the total of two pages so they really are not that big of a deal. It really makes no difference. DNF at page 44. It took more than two weeks to get that far. It couldn't hold my interest at all. Fantasy is my favorite genre but this was completely boring. I do agree with that. The first hundred pages were difficult to get through. I think once you move past those you could potentially be more interested in it. However, I can totally understand why at page 44 you thought it was boring. I could care less about the characters and what was going on at this point. You were only at page 44. Take it from experience. I DNF'd two books very early on and I reread them recently and I actually quite enjoyed them. The only thing I am thankful for is I didn't buy the series, which was what I intended to do because of the rave reviews. Speaking of which, I will never trust their judgment again. Instead, I was able to borrow it virtually from the library and return it to the virtual world of things I don't give a fuck about. If you like my numbing, boring fantasy, then this is for you. I guess it's for me then. This was arguably my favorite one for Jade City. Someone did something, somehow. I don't know. I fell asleep after two chapters, but the cover is green, and it indeed is green. <laughs> I don't even know what this is referring to what someone did something somehow but I just love it because I think this review left me with more questions than it does answers. Now for my next book I didn't know what to pick out and I think I mostly based what books I chose for this video based on what I was able to find and I went for middle game which you guys know. <laughs> this book holds a special place in my heart. It was my favorite book of last year. I am literally rereading it this weekend. I am fully ready to do so. I am ready to read the second one. I've got an arc of it. I absolutely love the story and although the story starts out very abstract, I think the writing is sufficiently competent and beautiful to keep you engrossed and engaged in the story up until it does get somewhere and gets less confusing. I love the characters. I think they were really compelling and every time that I explain this book, the best way that I can explain it is human beings are born with power but because we don't practice them or enhance them as we grow older, we lose them. So what if we bred children in very conditioned capacities and really made them hone in on this ability to potentially achieve godhood and I think that's the best way to explain this book. I love it. However, this person did say this. The premise sounds cool but the plot ends up being nonsensical. I can just imagine a couple second graders coming up with a book idea. <clears throat> My favorite subject is math and yours is language arts. I bet if we fused brains we'd be so smart we could probably take over the world. Combine that with a convoluted mishmash of Frankenstein, Wizard of Oz, tarot cards, time travel and it just becomes a hot mess of the best kind in my opinion. I absolutely loved that the world was as nonsensical if we want to call it that and as crazy as it was. It made sense in my brain for as crazy as it sounds. I totally bought all of it and Shauna McGuire's writing just makes you feel so present in the story that even if you don't understand it at first you just kind of let yourself go with it up until there are more explanations and you understand and grasp more of the concept and the story and then the book ends and you're just left there as a shell of being wondering why a book that was so wild was so good. That is literally the best way I could explain it. It is a weird book. I can't deny that it's a weird book, but it's a weird that works. If you're that girly, you're that girly, okay? If you understand, you understand. This book was death itself. Not to mention the description is way too misleading. There is this girl who loves mathematics and there is this boy who loves literature and I was expecting to see some of that reflected in the book. Maybe I did not want to see one Sheldon Cooper and one Manny Delgado saving the world, but perhaps a little bit of that might have saved this book. And what I will personally say to that is did we not read the same scenes? There are literally several scenes in which Dodger is literally solving mathematic equations and literally going berserk on walls, writing numbers, and trying to figure logics out in these numbers. And Roger too, he is literally a literature professor. He literally exemplifies the love of literature many, many times in this book. And it does not end there. Both these characters who are supposed to be twins are telekinetic 
connected and also happen to physically bump into each other in, wait for it, rom-com-esque meet cutes. Yeah! I will agree with that though, because there was one scene in the book where the idea of twins seemed just a tiny bit romanticized, and I think it was suggested by somebody else that they looked like they were dating and they were like, no, we're not. We're just kind of siblings, I guess. I will give this person that. In conclusion, there is Stephen King creepy and then there is this book. It does not keep you hooked. None of the characters have any depth. It takes about a millennium to actually start making sense. And eventually you just want to stop, stare at the wall and scream, why, why, why? I also don't know how adequate it is to compare Stephen King to Middle Game because I don't believe that they reside in the same realm. I would not consider Middle Game a horror book by any means. I do believe it has overlapping features with the horror genre, but it's fantasy. It's mainly a fantasy sci-fi book, but not necessarily a horror book in and out of itself. It has very different beats to it. And I would also clearly disagree with it very respectfully. I loved the book. It did keep me hooked. And I think it was the one book at the point in time where I read it that taught me that pacing yourself with books is healthy and is very much enjoyable. I put some snobby classical music in the background and I was living my main character dream, okay? It was fantastic for me. And I would also say the characters do have a lot of depth. There is a lot of mentions of mental health, particularly with Dodger and everything that she's personally going through, and a lot of fear of abandonment and also codependent tendencies, and also, again, the whole theory thing being explored and what that causes in these kids mentally and how that affects their everyday life. I really do think they had a lot of depth, and I think the book was interesting, but that could just be me projecting how much I loved it and trying to justify why I love it because it's part of my job and I just really like the book. Maguire follows the same template as the Starless Sea but offers less of its beauty. This is actually really interesting given the fact that I have DNF'd the Starless Sea. I think the Starless Sea, while it does have a semi-interesting premise and it does have really beautiful lyrical writing, I think the Starless Sea ends up being vastly more confusing than Middle Game and I don't say that very lightly because Middle Game does have a a lot of scientific stuff in there that again could potentially come across as very nonsensical and I definitely do think that it does come as nonsensical. However, the starless sea I found that just remains nonsensical and confusing for most of what I read, if not all of what I read. So while I do agree that both of them tend to be very nonsensical, I would say that the starless sea more than middle game tends to be a bunch of words put together without really saying a lot. Gavin, this is for you. You were right. That is Gavin's quote. He did say that to me and he was not wrong. He was, he was right. And this is arguably my favorite. I don't know how else to illustrate this, this message. I also had to include this book in here just because I think that out of all of the books that I've rated very highly, this I knew would probably have a lot of one star reviews and that is Strange the Dreamer by Lainey Taylor. No one in this book is having a good time, least of all the reader. I had a good time. It was lyrical, it was beautiful, it spoke to my soul and I definitely think that if people don't like purple writing, they're just not gonna vibe with this. I definitely think that if people don't like character driven stories, Stories, they're not gonna like this and that is the majority of Strange. If you don't vibe with Strange as the main character, if you don't like the discussions of feelings of inadequacy and imposter syndrome, and again very whimsical writing and a world that just kind of grabs you into it and just kind of enter it and you don't want to let go, then you're probably not gonna vibe with this book. And it's also very slow, which is also an argument that I can give about this book. It's very slow. If you don't like slow paced stories, then uh, just you're, you're not gonna vibe sadly. This book had the nerve to be bad, but good enough to make me want Want to finish it at the same time, which made it worse. To all three people reading this review, don't read this book. This is how I felt with Serpent and Dove. <laughs> I literally gave Serpent and Dove one and a half stars and I literally go, this book had the nerve to be so bad and yet I still finished it and it was entertaining. When will it ever end? Why does this have so many great reviews? Wait, ugh, wait. <laughs> people liked Twilight too. This person's calling me out because I definitely liked Twilight when I was younger. <laughs> Premise. Fantastic. Execution. Dismal. This book had so much promise and was so incredibly disappointing. Just imagine a 13 year old picking up this book and reading about the inner thoughts of a 20 year old man, about a 17 year old girl in excruciating detail up until the intention is only just barely veiled. The entire book is riddled with thoughts about sex, finding someone to have sex with, and unless you want to have babies, you have no purpose in life. I feel like this was a failed adult fiction book, so they made the characters younger, took out the swearing, put a sense bar 
over the actual sex. I definitely do not remember Strange being riddled with mentions of sex and it being extremely sexual. I read this book and that is not at all what I got from it. Is there an attraction between Sarai and Laszlo? Absolutely yes, they are love interests. However, at the core of their relationship, it's neither physical or again riddled with thoughts of sex. I am very confuzzled. I also agree with this book's age range being slightly confusing. I still don't know like what this book is. Like I always kind of question that. I was like, if this is supposed to be YA, it doesn't feel like YA. The writing doesn't feel YA. The execution doesn't feel it either. The world doesn't feel it either. And I don't know if it's because the book has a lot of younger characters and a lot of the time publishing houses and authors themselves just feel the need that because the characters are young, they just throw it in YA. Or maybe they thought the premise itself would sell more as YA. Definitely don't know what happened there, but this book definitely gives me adult vibes. Clara and the Sun was another one that I was not planning on including in this video. However, I thought if there's any book that I really enjoyed last year that would probably have a lot of bad reviews, it would probably be Clara. I have heard a lot of arguments against this book saying that it was extremely boring, exploration of humanity wasn't even that good and it was very basic, and while I do agree that it could have gone deeper into the subject matter, I generally think that the exploration of humanity through artificial intelligence, through a relationship of the artificial intelligence and a young girl is incredibly interesting and it's incredibly interesting to see Clara kind of grow into herself wearing sunglasses for this review because I am anti-sun and anti-Clara. Dude, what the heck? I wish I had quotes to put at the front of this review, but nothing remarkable grasped my attention long enough to highlight it. Clara and the Sun is such a fitting title for this novel. I mean, it is literally about Clara and the Sun. Exactly. The novel begins with Clara, an artificial friend, in a storefront. Because this novel is in her POV, the dictation is very straightforward and simplistic. She knows she needs the sunlight to survive. Is she a plant? Question mark. And values its importance. Therefore, the first one-fourth of the novel is Clara in the shop window and her observances of the sun. The way that I took that is that Clara is coming into herself exactly as a human being would. She enters the story with a very childlike mindset, with a very childlike innocence. She doesn't really know what the sun is, how it works, only knows that because of her solar panels, she has to feed on it in order to get energy. She just doesn't really understand the nuances of it, of course, because she's not human. And so to me, it made total sense to have Clara be the main character of the book and be as obsessed with the sun as she is because she doesn't really understand its concept. And then have that mirror the young girl who's going to be her companion in the story and how similar yet different their journeys are into growing as individuals, I guess, if we want to call it that because Clara is obviously not human. That's, that's the way that I looked into it and I really enjoyed it. Then for 600 pages, we- wait. This book, no. This book is 307 pages, not 600. Clara wants to destroy the pollution causing machine. Clara prays to the sun. Clara thinks about the sun. Clara meets different people and somehow manages to convince them to help her with her sun plan. And again, it's that childlike innocence in her. Every single kid I've met before makes adults promise things just because they think it's the right move and it's something that they believe in. And they're so young and their brain just works that way that, that again, they don't understand the nuances of that. And I think, Clara's behavior really reflects that. And again, the book truly makes you question if artificial intelligence is the right move to replace humans and how much humanity plays into the equation and if she really will be more human than humans themselves. It's a really interesting line of questioning in my opinion. Bill Gates did me dirty with this recommendation. And I think my first question would be, why are you reading books that Bill Gates recommends? Is that something people do? Like I genuinely have the question. I could not imagine. The plot was all over the place and poorly explained. The characters also poorly fleshed out. Lots of allusions to how the world they live in worked, but the actual explanations, clarifications never came. The ultimate goal of this book is exploring if there is really anything unique about humanity once AI gets to a certain caliber, a well-explored concept that this novel provided no additional insight into. I have no qualms with giving this book one star and I'm curious now to go read the reviews of others to see what exactly about this book that I enjoyed. Anything that I previously mentioned is what I enjoyed and I say it yet again. Well, yes, it could have been explored in more depth. I do think the statements are there. I do think the exploration was there. The only thing that comes to mind is that maybe it wasn't explored in the way that people were expecting it to be explored. And last but not least, I had to include another book because I just felt like it wasn't enough and I was like, let's do more. And I ended up choosing People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry. I think Emily Henry's books are pretty well received by the people. I think people generally really love them, but 
What was interesting was that upon stumbling into the review section of this book, it seems that a lot of people who actually loved Beach Read didn't end up really enjoying this one, which is interesting because I read them backwards. I read People We Meet on Vacation first and I gave it five stars and I read Beach Read and I didn't love it as much. I still thought it was really good and I gave it four stars. It just wasn't a five star in the same way that People We Meet on Vacation was, that my experience with People We Meet on Vacation was very personal. I have in the past gone through experiences of trying to make relationships work in the same realm of like friends lovers and it unfortunately hasn't worked out in the past and so I felt a little bit more deeply connected to the storyline of like unrequited love and so I vibed with it and I personally really liked the characters and I liked their banter and I liked the relationship and I like that their relationship also exists and happens off page so there are a lot of things that we don't see or don't know up until we do and I like that the story kind of happens on its own as well without us having to watch over it. If a man pulls a sad puppy face at you run as fast as you can and that, I just had to put that in here because I thought it was funny. I've never really seen anybody around me do the sad puppy face, not for a long, long time. So I don't know if that's supposed to be a red flag for people, but I saw it and I was, I genuinely thought it was hilarious. When Harry met Sally, but if it was written by a 16 year old on Wattpad, I guess I could see that. I was gonna try and come up with something real clever, but I think she got me y'all. <laughs> The man and woman who have been friends for years are actually in love with each other? This book never really found its way. The main characters were one dimensional and the big fight and resolution happened in like 20 pages. Welcome to every romance book ever. I won't go ahead and say every single book because I think that's an overstatement. However, I do think a lot of the books, if not the majority of the books that I have read in the romance contemporary realm that include, again, semblance of relationships and romance, every time, dude, every time miscommunication happens at one point and then they resolve it in the last 10 to 20 pages and suddenly everybody is walking happily into the sunset as if nothing happened and it was that easy to correct and sometimes communication and miscommunication is not that easy to solve and it takes a little bit more effort than that just to clear the air. A lot of the time miscommunication ends a breaking relationship whether they're romantic or not and there are times where relationships really can't be mended and you really do see a shift in dynamic and so I won't really blame this book for doing that. I think out of every miscommunication communication scenario that I read. This is probably one of those that bothered me the least. I think at this point, and somebody also said this in my comments a while ago, and I do agree, there is a certain point where we're just gonna have to embrace that miscommunication is gonna be a part of every single romance book, or the majority of them, just because miscommunication happens in real life, and it's sad and true, and I don't want it in my escapism, but it's literally unescapable, which is the most ironic thing out of all of it. And that is everything that I have for you guys today. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. I hope that you guys enjoyed me reacting to these one star reviews of some of my favorite books. Let me know down below if you've read any of these, what you thought, if you agree, if you disagree. What one star reviews have you read in the past that have just made you crack out loud or that you didn't necessarily agree with? Let a girl know. Maybe it's one of mine. I know I've given a lot of low star ratings to things you guys have personally loved in the past. So I'd be really interested in knowing what your takes are. If you did enjoy this video, don't forget to give it a massive thumbs up down below and subscribe as well for more bookish content that is always happening in this corner of the internet. And if you want to support the channel further and want more content from me, I do have a Patreon. We call ourselves The Citadel. And there is always a bunch of stuff happening over there that you're not going to see anywhere else. We have exclusive live streams, exclusive videos, a book club, buddy reads, a Discord server, and just a bunch of fun stuff happening over there. So if you do want to sign up, that is always linked down below alongside all of my social medias. And once more, thank you so much to Sundance Now for sponsoring today's video. You can go to SundanceNow.com and use the code MELREADS to get your first 30 days for free to try it out and maybe what a discovery of witches which you will hopefully love as much as i did i love you guys so so much and i shall see you on the next one bye guys mm -hmm.